As each year comes to a close, it's always nice to reflect on the past 12 months, to appreciate the good things. This is especially true of the past year in particular, finding moments of fun and positivity amongst the bleakness of a pandemic and as many scandals as is possible to fit into a 365 day period. Special thanks goes to Barbie Kotick and Activision Blizzard for lots of the heavy lifting in this department. Your efforts have not gone unnoticed. And the 2021 Game of the Year is... Barbie Kotick. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Although, I recommend setting treat people like human beings as a New Year's resolution. But, as with most resolutions, I don't think it'll stick with Bobby. But, to the topic at hand, albeit a drastically less important one. As this is a video adaptation of my part in the Super Jump Games of the Year piece, I'll be following their rules. Meaning that not only games that released in 2021 count, but also those that had significant updates within the past year. While I was asked to choose my top three games for Super Jump, I'm going to push it to five for this video because there were just so many great games this year. Even with five, I feel like I'm cruelly missing out games that I love, like Destiny 2, which absolutely consumed me this year, or Halo Infinite, which would be among my top games of the year, but at this point, everyone knows how good it is, so I've decided to talk about some smaller names than Halo for the most part. I'm also going to note that these games are in no order in particular, Choosing a top 3 and top 5 was hard enough. Ranking them might actually kill me. If someone tells me 2021 was a bad year for games, make them look at the full list of games that came out this year and task them with picking only a handful. With all that said and done, welcome to my Games of the Year for 2021. Round of Oilios, please! Ooh, that's nice! Ooh, I like that! Thinking about my favourite games of the year, Deep Rock Galactic immediately came to mind. Although it originally launched back in 2018, Deep Rock received its biggest update yet this year, and has very deservingly earned a place in this list. Deep Rock Galactic is pretty simple. You play as a hardy dwarf and team up with other dwarfs to mine for valuable minerals and complete a mission objective, which varies depending on the mission type, on the dangerous, bug-infested planet of Hoxie's 4. The developers have a very clear goal in mind for Deep Rock, and they nail it. They know what makes Deep Rock tick, and they focus purely on that, resulting in unadulterated fun as you dive into a cave, fend off hordes of gross bugs while you search for valuables and grind on pipelines, hunt for boss monsters, recover lost machinery, or escort a huge drill named Doretta, and escape with your lives in this extremely charming co-op first-person shooter. This simplicity is what makes Deep Rock such a great experience. It really is pure fun. Four classes you can choose from offer a distinct playstyle and personality that fit together like a puzzle, giving everyone in the group a role, but no one a boring job. Like the Scout, for instance. The Scout has a grappling hook which is helpful for reaching those out of reach minerals. Yet, even on alien planets exist the forces of gravity and fall damage. The bane of any grappling hook happy Scout. Thankfully, when there's not a natural ledge for the scout to land on, an engineer can shoot one up there. Likewise, the driller, if the name didn't already give it away, drills paths for the team through the fully destructible environment, while the gunner shields the team and creates zip lines for the team to rain down firepower from above. 
This type of teamwork comes naturally in Deep Rock, as each class is constructed to do well in particular things, but to come together as a team to survive. And players know this too, which is very, very rare in team-based games. The community, actually, has to be one of Deep Rock's strongest elements. Everyone I've played with has always been so kind and entertaining, joining in on jokes and playing as a team. This is one case where it actually does just work. Bartender, a round of Clifford Slammers for my team! May your beards Those be thick lost. and your gold satchels heavy. Mm, yeah. I needed that. It's because of the great community that I've been able to enjoy it as much as I have. I often see people asking whether Deep Rock is playable by yourself, without a group of friends to make it more fun or help with coordination. And I often see yes in reply. Yet, I don't fully agree with this. In fact, I've only ever played Deep Rock by myself, and yet here it is on my Game of the Year list. And if you follow me on Twitter, then you'll see me talking about it constantly. Sure, it may help to have a group of friends to dive into Hoxies alongside you, but Deep Rock is still such an experience as a lone wolf, because the community is just that strong. Deep Rock Galactic was already an expertly crafted game that knew how to have fun, but the release of Season 1, Rival Incursions this November, raised the bar even higher. It saw the addition of crazy new weapons, like a gun with an eyeball that locks on, like the smart pistol from Titanfall, or one that lobs corrosive sludge, alongside new mission events, even more customization, and a performance pass. What's more, this is all free and stays in the game forever. No FOMO in Deep Rock. After all, this game is all about fun. Deep Rock Galactic is an excellent game that can be picked up at incredibly good value. In fact, it's even on Xbox and PC Game Pass and available in PS Plus for January. And you'd be missing out on a hidden gem if you didn't give it a look. Rock and Stone. So are you ready, kid? Yeah. And what are you ready for? Safety. Oh, you think the human mind is safe? Well, that's cute. Now, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but Psychonauts 2 is awesome. You may see the 2 in the title and turn away thinking, how can I play 2 if I haven't ever played 1? Well, the original Psychonauts came out way back in 2005 and, while amazing, didn't make a big splash at launch. Double Fine don't expect you to know about Psychonauts 1, so they provide a thorough recap of events and take the story in a direction that stands on its own. While the original didn't launch to thunderous applause, Psychonauts 2 certainly has. From the moment you boot up Psychonauts 2, you can feel the passion behind it. A sequel to a game often overlooked, 16 years in the making. It feels like a game they've always wanted to make, and so they poured heart and soul into it, to give it the breath of life that the original missed out on, for the most part. A big part of my love for this game is the way that narrative is so deeply intertwined with gameplay and level design. In Psychonauts 2, much like in the original, you'll find yourself diving into the minds of various people. But this isn't just for insane level design possibilities. It's also to literally and metaphorically explore the minds of those you dive into. I'll keep it vague to avoid spoilers. In one moment early in the game, protagonist Raz jumps into the mind of his teacher, a serious and responsible person, likely due to their background in healthcare, hoping to change their mind on an important decision concerning Raz and his fellow interns. To do so, Raz explores her protective and apprehensive psyche to find out what made her that way, and how to make them take more risks. But this doesn't quite work out the way he imagined, and the landscape is transformed from a hospital into a casino, giving physicality to the many complex inner workings of the human mind. Another great example is Compton's Cook-Off, which uses a culinary game show to illustrate the effects of performance anxiety and overcoming such fears. I'm purposely trying to be vague and not spoil anything from later in the game because it really would hamper the joy, being surprised by what this game will throw at you next. Get a hold of yourself, Oleander. I don't want fighting the Ligula without my battle fight, cheapskates. Hey, I'm with you. Letting him build the battle anything is probably a bad idea. Hmm. 
Psychonauts 2 also maintains the excellent writing from the first game, that will have you chuckling from a well-timed joke one minute to self-reflective the next as you explore the various mental worlds, with themes of mental health, including PTSD, anxiety and panic attacks, and of bonds with friends and family straining with time. These are themes that are often hard to express and articulate, but Psychonauts 2 approaches them with care and sincerity, but also with joy and entertainment at the forefront. All in all, Psychonauts 2 is a blast that is constantly subverting expectations and introducing fun and engaging new mechanics into the mix. The characters are well written, balancing great humour with real emotions. Level design is absurd, with each level, each mental world, you experience featuring completely unique design and gameplay, like mini-games, game shows, boss fights, plenty of platforming, even riding bowling balls, and so much more. Psychonauts 2 is a joy through and through. Long ago, in a land you might remember from your dreams, the power of randomness was celebrated by all. Those with dice would roll them to shape their destinies, and the bravest few would challenge each other in games of chance, epic tournaments, in which their very lives would hang in the balance. Lost in Random, I feel, was a bit of a sleeper hit of 2021, which is surprising given that it was published by EA, one of the largest names in gaming. It may not be perfect, but it certainly does aim to be unique, and it succeeds for the most part, which earned my respect and admiration in a time where we see an abundance of samey open world RPGs and first person shooters. It's for this reason that I want to highlight this gem, in the hopes that we'll see more games follow suit with brave genre mashups. Speaking of genre mashups, just what is Lost in Random, you ask? Well, Lost in Random is many things. It's real-time action, it's a dice rolling game, a card builder, and at times, even a digital board game. You'd be excused for thinking that this many different features in one game would turn out like a sloppy mess, an idea that spreads itself far too thin to fully achieve any of its aspirations. But it actually works much better than it sounds. Gameplay generally revolves around shooting at crystal weak spots on foes with a slingshot, as hitting them anywhere else does zero damage. To collect crystals to power your dice rolls. Rolling your dice, known as Dicey, will give you a small selection of cards from your customised and upgradable card deck to use in battle. The higher the roll, the more points you have to spend on cards during that roll, with better cards typically costing more points. Moves include a big mallet to do melee damage and stun spawning a bow for long range damage, planting mines, slowing time, and more. The combat is unique, engaging, and simple to get to grips with, despite how it might sound, with my only gripe being that it doesn't take this concept even further. There's also some really interesting combat encounters on offer in Lost in Random. The board game type encounters that I mentioned earlier on stand out in particular, as they often have unique mechanics, like one where even has to arm cannons to defeat a boss, while using walls to hide from the boss's own cannons. But which one you get is decided by a dice roll, which led to some pretty hectic moments of needing to stay alive just that bit longer to roll a cannon to deal the last bit of damage to finish the boss. Our story begins later in Wongroft, a small village populated entirely by people who have never once been dealt a fair hand. Attention, Warners! I am the Queen, and my dark dice will decide your fate. Random rules! To keep the player moving forward is a story of two sisters, even and odd, in a magical world based around chance and randomness, known as random. It begins with Odd being taken away by the evil Queen to serve her following a dice roll ceremony that decides the fate of children at the age of 12, and even setting out to rescue her. Along the way, Even ventures to several fantastical places, including Two Town, a place where every inhabitant has a double with the opposite personality, which leads to some really charming and funny moments of interacting with the clashing personalities. Seymour, the Mayor and Royam in Two Town are a lot of fun and really where I fell in love with the game. Indubitably, we're twins! We finish each other's sentences! 
We double each other's happiness. We share each other's husbands. Then there's Threedom, which has been embroiled in war between eccentric triplets for years, explaining the World War One-style battlefield at the centre of the area. The narrative we through these Tim Burton-esque environments will frequently surprise you in interesting ways, and keep you smiling through charming characters and dialogue. I'll leave the other areas and characters for you to discover because they really are a lot of fun to come across for the first time. I love Lost in Random because it's original, it does its own thing, and while it might not do it perfectly, it is nonetheless captivating visually, with fun gameplay to boot, set in a charming world based on randomness. And now, for my two additional games to make it to my top five games of the year. The first of which goes to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, because wow, this game is awesome. This is what the Avengers game should have been all along, a focused, action-driven, single-player story. It's so painful to see how good that game could have been if it was handled right, because Guardians gives us the perfect comparison. I've loved meeting this new interpretation of the crew. In fact, I think they may very well be my favourite rendition of the Guardians yet. They're constantly bickering with each other and making jokes, and at times it doesn't even seem like they like each other and want to be there. But this back and forth between the team comes across so naturally and fluidly, which really is a testament to the writing team behind this. You're 60 clicks from the fortress. I'd say closer to 75. Well, there is only one way to know for sure. 0 0.1 clicks. 0 0.2 clicks. I was going to say that Drax, Gamora and Rocket were high points in particular, but then I realised that that is basically the whole cast, that can speak at least. Well, anything more than I am Groot. I suppose that's the biggest praise I can give this game. The characters. I love every interaction, every line, and the journey that you go on has been a blast. The very nature of this being a game gives the characters more room to just exist to be themselves and interact with each other in a way that the films don't often get the chance to do. Besides the narrative, Guardians also bolsters some pretty fun combat. You play as Peter, Star-Lord, but you can call on your crew to use special moves in combat. For instance, crew can hold people in place and shoot roots up from the ground. Rocket can pull groups of enemies together or blow them all up. And Gamora can dash between enemies and deal high single target damage. This teamwork element has been really fun to play around with, although it is a bit clunky overall because of how these abilities are accessed. Especially your own abilities, which I keep forgetting actually exist. Before playing it, I was a bit let down by the fact that you couldn't play as the other characters. And while I'm sure that that would be fun, I like it how it is. When you get into a groove, it just feels so great, especially when the 70s music is blasting in your ears after a group huddle. Every time they go splat, it paints an awfully nice picture. <laughs> There's no way we lose today, Quill. You know what I see when I look at that battlefield? I see all of you. I'm mesmerized. Mesmerized? What? Seriously. You make me want to play 24 hours a day. So what do you say we run these guys to the ground, huh? When you're not fighting, there's some light exploration for little bits of lore, upgrade materials and outfits, which is a nice break from combat. It also gives plenty of time for the amazing dialogue that I mentioned before. And it doesn't hurt that the environments are not only visually diverse, interesting and beautifully detailed, but it's also absolutely stunning. Seriously, this may very well be the best looking game I have ever played. The artists have gone above and beyond in bringing this world to life. Guardians just oozes style at every turn. Whether that's the absolutely stunning environments that you explore, the music kicking in as your team rallies in a fight, the writing is utter perfection, the story is engaging, and the combat is stylistic chaos despite it being a little bit clunky. 
All in all, Guardians of the Galaxy is awesome. And last but not least. It Takes Two is arguably the best co-op game ever made. Sure, there's plenty of games that are excellent co-op experiences, but It Takes Two takes it to a whole new level. Designed to be played by two players in split screen at all times, It Takes Two follows May and Cody, a married couple planning on divorce, trapped in the bodies of their daughter's dolls. Shrunking down to the size of ants, they now have to find a way back to Rose and work on their relationship. It's a heartfelt narrative that also has plenty of time for laughs. But the narrative of It Takes Two is not the main attraction, it's merely to keep the momentum going between the incredible gameplay scenarios that take centre stage. One moment you'll be jumping around the garden shed, and the next you're shooting your friend out of a hoover to reach a higher place and jumping between rails. Or you'll be using nails to hold platforms while your friend uses the hammer to open new paths. Or you'll be sailing a boat down a waterfall while your partner shoots. Hazelight Studios craft whole new experiences every five minutes and drop them shortly after like a kid on Christmas, but it keeps the game fresh and exciting the whole way through. You could honestly build a game out of just one of the mechanics or level designs that Hazelight throw at you. I can imagine the meetings to come up with ideas after a way out, and they've got this board with sticky notes full of concepts, and someone said, why not just do all of them? And so that's what they did, and it never gets old. These moments are just so much fun but they're even better when you each have a different job to do. As is the theme, you'll have to work together and trust each other to get by. And that elevates the whole experience. I really don't want to say too much more because this game really is such a joy to play for the first time. But it'll be really interesting to see how Hazelight can top this. And why have no other studios caught on to this style yet? Hazelight are doing something really awesome. But that's it. That's my top 5 games of 2021. It really was hard to whistle it down to just five games, because this year was surprisingly good. It's a huge testament to the talent of the developers working on games right now, that even under such circumstances, they endure and make masterful experiences. Hopefully this year will be better, but we'll find a way. Thank you to everyone who has supported me on YouTube and Medium, thank you to the amazing team at Superjump, and thank you to anyone who has ever shared something I've made. It really does mean a lot. Here's to another year of video games. Welcome to 2022.